الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وأحلى العقم سنف القولي السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته and welcome to another episode of the Living with Baraka show how to design your life with Baraka how to bring heart centered design principles to your life this and more is part of our show today inshallah ta'ala let's get started Thank you so much for joining us live for this live show on how to design your life with Baraka. Today I have a special guest for you. We have to with us today none other than Peter Gould, the Chief Design Officer of Gould Studio. Really excited to have you brother. Assalamu alaikum Peter. Wa alaikum salam. Likewise Muhammad. It's such a blessing to be on a call with you and uh, thanks everyone for tuning in. Alhamdulillah. Really Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Thank you so much for joining. I know it's really early for you in Australia right now. But you've come in the office, you've got your coffee, you're ready for this, inshallah ta'ala. <laughs> Talking about design, spirituality, life, I mean, can't get better than this. <laughs> yeah, it's it's really, uh, I, I agree. I mean, uh, you know, it's it's it, you know, it's early-ish here, but not too early. And I was going to, I know I'm going to derail a conversation already, but the coffee that I'm enjoying today, Alhamdulillah, is coming out of a cup Ooh. which says Haji Peter, which is a gift from yourself, Muhammad. And I think what you're talking about, the, the Baraka, and even such a simple thing as an object like that, the blessing that, you know, I carry, it's a story. I think of you, I think of Hajj and that time. So, you know, you talk about design with Baraka, a simple object like that can really bring meaning and blessing because of the intentionality. But Anyway, we've got a lot to talk about, but yes. I thought I'd start with that. No, no, no that's, that, that's perfect. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's a good example. I mean, for my first question I wanted to ask you was, so you're somebody who's been in the design field for, for a long time. And what I love about how you look at design, you don't look at design. A lot of people think of design of just logos and branding and colors, and, we, and that's part of it. But you see design as something larger. You see design. Can you just talk about this design and life and why do you feel design is such an important aspect of our lives today that perhaps you don't even notice? Yeah, absolutely. So something I'm really passionate about, and I've had really the you know, uh, uh, you know, a, a very fortunate journey over the last you know 15, 20 years through design. And even in that time, there's been different you know stories and journeys of of, of understanding and starting to observe how and, and what design is. Um, but if you ask, you know, a person on the street, you know, say like, hey, what's design or how, what, what do designers do? Um, you'll probably get answers, um, good answers like, oh, you know, maybe interior design or fashion or graphic design, digital design, these sorts of things. And these are particular disciplines that, you know, professionals do. But design is really a powerful mindset that anyone can embrace. And if you think about what is the, at the heart of that, design is change, design is transformation. And people with a design mindset might be, you know, in corporate world, they might be a leader, they might be in a small business or even a school. And what they do is they look at a particular problem and say, okay, how can I design my way through to find some great creative solutions to this using imagination, maybe technology. Uh, and, and you do that through a series of iterations and changes and prototypes. So design is actually something that we can all embrace. You don't have to wear a turtleneck skivvy and, you know, try and quote Steve Jobs to, to think about being a designer. Uh, every one of us on the call tuning in, it's something we can adopt as a mindset. Uh, and I think that becomes very profound when we, we think of it in that way. Absolutely. I love that. And, and you can think about just the everywhere you look, right, you know, from everywhere you look, literally from every part of your life is touched by design. Somebody, you know, designed this mug, somebody, you know, took a, took time to think about how something looks, whether good or bad, but there's someone to, to impact that. But I guess, I guess for us, I guess if someone is like, I'm not a designer, but I want to design my life, you know, that sounds like a bit, a bit, uh, you know, like who am I to design my life? <laughs> like how do you even like what? So, what does that <laughs> yeah. sound like? So how do you how do you yeah. talk about design and life? Where do you, where do those two meet? Yeah, so it's a great question, and I think there's there's a few steps that we kind of lead to start thinking about making those connections. So I mean, what you just said is ex exactly right. If anyone on on the the call right now looked around in your room, wherever you are and think about whatever object you think of. You know, you can even do that right now. It's a fun activity and just say, okay, let's say I'm gonna pick up a, a watch or a mug or a, a lamp, uh, you know, or maybe it's an app that you're using in another screen while you're trying to do two things at once. Um, 
these uh that's okay by the way. we don't judge you know we are with you know the uh the, the productive muslim here but he's i know he's very generous and welcoming in his different approaches to productivity uh and the point being there is that those experiences those products they all started as a problem needing to be solved and you know maybe it was generations ago or maybe it's more recent and using this imagination and series of prototypes and, and a series of decisions, many decisions, you arrive at that design which you now have. And it, I'm pretty sure whatever it is, isn't the final design. There's always going to be someone iterating, improving, changing, adapting, whether it's physical object, but also things like services. So, you know, a lot of people working from home this year or being based at home, maybe they're having food delivery or maybe they're having to use apps to order things online more. Think about how does that experience work? Is it easy to order? Is it easy to pay? Is it easy to know where your, your delivery is? Um, these experiences, particularly in the last maybe five to 10 years, these digital experiences have to be designed for the user to be uh, you know, uh, you know, in, you know, comfortable, to understand it's gonna be easy, fast. So it's not just how it looks, but design is how it works and how does it make us feel? That's also another leap of design. What's our emotional response? So when we're using certain brands, so one of my favorites, as, as you know, Mohammed, uh, our friend Chris and his team that run LaunchGood, uh, when we use the LaunchGood platform, we're feeling like we're contributing, we're helping. It's designed in a way that um, you know, we're part of a global community, the personality of the brand and the way it's communicated to us makes us feel like we're, we're able to help and be involved, which, which is a really wonderful thing to design for. So that all of those things have to be designed. There's literally thousands of decisions that, you know, it, it, you know are involved um, that, to get to that product or service. Now, when you come to talking about, okay, well, how does that apply to my life? I think you said it right. You know, even just the question, it's a pretty bold, maybe audacious question is like, well, can you design your life? And I think it's a bit of a convenient term, but anyone who knows, particularly anyone on the spiritual path will know that, well, you know, uh, the, the, you know, there is a, de there is an ultimate designer who is designing the entire context and everything is done with wisdom and beauty and, and, uh, and perfect justice. Um, however, we still have to bring to our life, you know, intentionality, sincerity, uh, you know, uh, hopefully maybe some direction of what we'd like to try, where we'd like to go, the things we care about, the inspiration and, that we get, the causes that we start to care about, that pulls you along through a design process to wanting to work on those things. And I think what I'd like to talk about in the next little while is what are the, some of the tools and techniques that help you more actively think about that the same way that we would think about designing a product or a brand or a service you can actually extract some of the thinking and the tools to apply those in your life. So, um, you know, that's something I can share a little bit more about in a minute. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, and, and that's, I mean, it's fascinating. The idea of, the, of you thinking about your life as a, you said the word problem, right? Problem you're trying to solve. And that could be, it doesn't have to be a product or service. It could be, for example, let's say you're struggling with raising a child or you're struggling it doesn't have to be a problem. It could be just something, you know, we talk about, we talk about favorite problems, right? And how, how, how might I, you know, do X, Y, and Z? How should I, you know, I'm struggling with this part of my business or I'm looking at this part of my family life or my spirituality. And I, tr and I think of that as a design problem and frame it that way. And I think, as, I think, you, I, think I'm, I heard you once say that, and, and many others say that design is really, is, it's about framing the question the right way. Can you just talk about just starting off with that? Like, how do we frame life issues as design problems that need to be solved. Yeah, beautifully said. I think you've captured it well. So what we're talking about here is, so let's say in a commercial context or in some kind of project, a designer or design team or whatever kind of team approaching it, um, they won't just see it, see some challenge and then engineer a solution straight away, or they might, but the, most, the more sophisticated and creative and innovative solutions will be to actually start further back and ensure we're asking the right question. Are we solving the right problem in the right way? You know, it's like someone comes to you and says like, hey, um, you know, I need to build a bridge between here and here. And then if, you know, a bunch of engineers is going like, yeah, great, we're gonna build the best bridge, it's gonna be made of iron, it's gonna be like, it's gonna, you know, you can fit 10,000 cars on it, this bridge is gonna be amazing. But then if you spend time with the people that live on either side of that, that uh, lake or whatever, they might say, no, we don't want a bridge. We just, we want a nice ferry service. You know, it keeps more harmony. The little, you know, the boats can take us across. You need to spend time with the user, with the people, you know, who are using it. That's this idea of human-centered design is listening, having empathy, understanding. And there's lots of good examples of this, you know, human-centered design or design thinking. 
So when you start trying to apply that same approach to your life, it's it's looking at things that come along. So you know, a simple example might be like, okay, I'm a busy parent. Uh, I've got a lot going on. I've you know, I've got sort of my work here, and I'm trying to start this little business on the side. I've got my Instagram folio. I'm trying to build this, you know, b- work on these kids' product or a book I'm writing. But I also want to give great quality education to my kids and spend time with my parents. All the things you talk about, Mohammed, like you know, balancing these things. Um, what a design mindset allows you to do is reframe those and ask better questions. So the simple as like, how might I spend more time with my kids while still growing a business? Okay. The idea is that you just by changing the questions a little bit, um, or you might change it like, how can I bring more storytelling into my day with the kids? Okay. When you start opening up your questions, you bring the potential for a lot more creativity to it. So rather than like, how do I drop my kids to school in the morning? You might say like, how might I engage them with beautiful storytelling? And you might put on a little audio book or podcast and then ask questions. You might allow yourselves, even within the current uh, limitations of time, to just you know get closer to what you want to have, which is a better relationship, a more loving, um, you know, creative engagement with them. Or how might I reduce my kids' screen time? Might become well, you know, how might I incorporate more play time with you know a little bit of the screen time that they they're always desperate to have <laughs> so it's design thinking is all about reframing things and reframing the question and the, the last thing i'll say you had a really good phrase which is this idea of how might we questions and this is really something pioneered and and championed by stanford design school by ido leading design firms today that have helped you know um, create some incredible products that we all use they ask these, they, they, they take their design challenges and ask, how might we? So, you know, how might we spend, you know, more time with our kids in a playful way? Or how might I, you know, be a better, uh, you know, a better partner or a better friend, uh, you know, rather just like, oh, I need to call that person, <laughs> you know. So it might not be about calling. It might be like, oh, I need to send them a gift. Maybe I need to send them this lovely mug. <laughs> so when, you know, whenever I pick that up, I think of Muhammad Faris. You know, so there's ways to, uh, you know, to be creative about the things you care about. I love that. So just to be clear, so if you're reframing questions, a couple of things. Number one, basically start with how might I or how might we? That's a that's a good phrase to start off with. And the second one is frame it positively, right? So it's not like how might I like reduce screen time, but how might I increase play time for my children? Like, is, is that is that a two? Is that is there anything else to think about when you reframing questions, especially for life situations? Yeah, yeah. Well, don't discount the power and potential of the right questions. You know, be, you know, spend a bit of time designing the questions, and that will actually be a key to unlocking things. So um, even the language you kind of use. So there's lots of examples in, um, you know, in the product design world. So for example, um, you know, uh, you could take. Uh, th- I mean, there's lots of stories I could share, but you know, one that I like is, you know, there was a. Um, a busy hospital, right? And, you know, you, the, the ambulance is in or out all the time. And so, um, you know, they had this question of like, oh, we need to check on the fuel. We need to check on, uh, you know, tire. we need to do a few things. And, you know, there's a maintenance crew, and whatever. But, you know, the lead kind of designer in that, in that environment, you know, looking at the whole work, you know, the whole experience of the staff and medical professionals said, well, how might we uh, reimagine our ambulance area as a pit crew? It's like a Formula One, you know, uh, thing. And the idea was that all of a sudden, and then giving them patches and uniforms, the people kind of working in that space, who that's their role, you know, they all of a sudden, just by changing the language, reframing the question, they, they get it. This analogy, this story works well, because then they're like, okay, all right, are you going to do the tires? I'm going to do this. I'm going to check on that. And it, there's lots of examples. So, you know, I don't know, uh, you know, again, I keep thinking of parenting, but like, what's the kind of story or analogy that will help you it could be exact same problem, but you reframe that and asking a better question will unlock this uh, this potential for more imaginative, fun, creative solutions to, to what you're trying to do. Love that. I'm going to try experiment right now with you. Let's see if it works. Let's say someone's saying, I'm, try, <laughs> sure. I'm trying to reduce the stress of the morning stress, right? You know, the morning stress of getting the kids ready and breakfast and running, getting, well, mm-hmm. it depends if you're schooling at home or schooling in person, but assuming the schools are running yeah. and it's someone's, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to reduce that stress. How would I frame mm-hmm. that problem and how would I, and take the, the design thinking process, perhaps just maybe perhaps you can come up with something novel right now, right on the show, live on Living with Baraka show. Yeah. <laughs> Let's do it. Yeah, S- sure. Self, yeah, self, solve no, a, a century old problem in, in the next 30 minutes. <laughs> Got it. 
got it. No, well, it's something we all face day to day. And I'm going to keep, uh, you know, bring my own story and like, you know, being a parent, you know, I'm to have three children, young age, school age. So, for example, parents find themselves all the time having to be spontaneous, having to be, uh, you know, design things on the spot. And they think of, you know, great, sometimes really great ways, uh, you know. The lazy, you know, easy thing is like, oh, take a screen, right? But most parents are trying to get away from that and say, all right, no, we know that that's the, you know, you get zero points for imagination there, you know. But, you know, to get, um, you know, the, the morning stress, for example, well, you know, I might say, well, how might you gamify certain elements? You know, uh, how might you, uh, you know, if, for example, like, you know, parts of it are just going to be the work. You've got to do certain things. But other parts might be like, okay, well, how might I gamify with my kids on the way to school? For example, um, give them 10 options of things they can do. Uh, and each one is just like a little story or sharing a thing or, you know, just simply. But the, just the process of going through the 10 options and then, you know, asking them to decide which one, that takes half the trip, mm -hmm. right? So you've already spent and you've had this nice conversation and you share these design elements. Now, if, you, if you're not kids, if you're not in that kind of school, a lot of people I know at home globally as well, um, what are ways you can just reimagine the process it's not as just kind of a checklist and stuff you got to do but uh, what elements from within that can you bring a different lens to so they have this in stanford d school where i spent some time one of the professors had this lovely phrase that he goes okay everyone knows about this idea of deja vu deja vu is this phrase you feel like you've seen it before yeah i've known that i'm very familiar with that he reversed it and called it vuja day vuja day so he goes try and embrace that I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, okay, bring a childlike curiosity and wonder to it. So when you see something for the first time, don't bring labels to it and try try to pull back all your, you know, association of what that thing is and bring a fresh lens to what that thing is. Children are the best at doing that. But as adults, we kind of get boxed into that. So some part of that stressful morning might be looking at a particular habit or something you have. And how do you reimagine that? Maybe it's just making the morning coffee. How do you bring joy and love and ahsan into that? Maybe there's certain beans and a little ritual you have that you've like, okay, this is the one part I'm going to find a bit of joy in, <laughs> you know, and put yourself through that. It's just, you know, we're people of habit, but there's there's so many ways when we can step out of that and and uh, and reframe, reimagine, and and bring uh, a bit of beauty and imagination to that. Love that, love that, and this connects to kind of like kind of second kind of I guess stream in your life which is spirituality like even though right now you're bringing phrase ihsan and beauty and if you can just step back a bit from design world and just talk about how how spirituality has fused into your work and your life in general and then we'll kind of take that step forward and talk about how how it applies to the design process so i'd love to hear just this element of spirituality because you know think okay that's how does it even connect to, to where you are today yeah absolutely it's a great question i appreciate it so um, in the context of design, let's if we were to try and distill it, you know, simply in, in English, like let's say um, if we think of design about is about the you know change in the outward world. It's about impact. It's about changing. It's transforming. It's about creating and building and having this outer external kind of um, design process, right? That's sort of you know design is really associated with that. But we, when we think about spirituality and the spiritual path and faith, it's really turning inward first in, and, and most importantly, change within, transforming yourself, working on this idea, not in a transactional way, but this ongoing lifelong gradual process of getting closer to God, knowing God through knowledge and understanding um, on this kind of seeking path of trying to, you know, through many st struggles and trials and tribulations, design problems <laughs> that they're, they're gifted to you for you to grow and overcome so we're just changing the language a little bit but it's a timeless um, thing that we all experience so every human experiences it so what i've sort of like to try and explore is like okay well you know we know we have this inward transformation process that we should be working on sometimes some days better than others and then we have this you know things that we'd like to do in the world we'd like to build or help or you know causes big or small some people want to have a giant you know billion dollar startup and you know impact a billion users that's awesome other people just want like you know a really just strong simple beautiful quiet family life but that still requires a lot of design effort <laughs> to protect you from the noise and distraction and addiction of digital everything right so both need design so when you bring these two things together, the spiritual path, we look at what concepts, what aspirations and principles that we can start applying to our design process to bring these two together. I love that. I love that. And, and, 
and already I'm hoping the, re the viewers can see that connection. So walk us through the process. Maybe maybe walk us through the typical um, design thinking process. What are the kind of common steps we'll follow in, in the design world? And then how does spirituality yeah. impact each of those processes? Yeah, absolutely. So we some of the, there's many different approaches to design and design process, but some, some of the key common threads you'll find are you know things like empathize so you know trying to understand and you know really f become familiar with what are the problems we're solving for um, and really you know at a human level make sure that what we're working on you know is actually meaningful and the right thing to kind of to solve for uh, rather than just kind of go off and build something and hope that it works but actually you know having this idea of you know understanding and often if it's something for yourself in your own life it, it's very easy because you you know what you're solving for um, but this, you'll have this process of iteration, of prototyping, and, and throughout life as well. It's not just you know, one product. It's actually your whole journey of life. You're learning, you're applying, you're adapting and sharing. And, and then you know, every 10 years, you might completely transform from what you might have had. That's prototyping, iterating, if you think about it. Um, and from a spiritual uh, journey perspective, uh, you know, if we look at our, our teachers and our sources of, of wisdom and authentic knowledge, um, there are many, many important spiritual concepts that can guide our decisions in life. So these are not new ideas, of course, but when you think about those applying to, you know, prototyping, empathizing, iterating, some of the words that I'll, I love to reflect on in our heart-centered approach here at, at our studio are starting with sincerity, sincerity with ikhlas. And, you know, something that, you know, I know Muhammad, one of our teachers talks a lot about is really, you know, at the heart of action, at the heart of um, any decision, if there's ikhlas there, sincerity, that is really, um, you know, at the root of the root of, of what, you know, what that is, the action will really count for at the end of the day. So that in sincerity, how does that apply to design? How, what, 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 and sincerity and intentionality, your niya, how does that apply to what you're building? Is the intention just to build a company uh, at what at any cost to go and you know don't care about where it's produced or you know the, what environmental cost it is or you know people just getting paid poorly and the conditions bad to make this thing you know I'm going to benefit the Umar and save the world oh but I don't care where it's made or you know the plastics what they're going to do like considering those things in the intentionality gives it that that blessing and when when you do that in that way. The craftsmanship. So I, I used the kind of adapted the word ahsan, ahsan. These terms we know are so deep and they're they're really endless in terms of the richness of these Arabic terms. But you know, ahsan or jamal or beauty. You know, and I kind of borrowed that as craftsmanship. So putting real love into what you're doing and building it could be a simple idea. It could be you know even just a lesson that you're planning to design for you know a group of people. But bring beauty and love and care into that will really raise the quality of that and the experience for people. Gratitude, this idea of, and, and designers, you know, professionally, they don't often connect all these things together, but coming into a design process with this sense of, you know, shukur and uh, the sense of accepting that, okay, I'm going to work on this as hard as I can, but ultimately I'm not in control <laughs> whether it's going to be successful in that way. Or, you know, but redefining our understanding of project success. It's not just about building, building huge companies and products that sell millions and millions of dollars. That's good if you can do that with sincerity and ikhlas as well. Um, but having a gratitude and an appreciation for wherever it's meant to go and accepting um, the good that comes with that and the difficulties that help you grow. And the last two things, um, the idea of amana. So understanding the gifts we have, our know, talents, our technology, our ability to prototype and get inspiration and ideas to build things, um, that's actually an amana. It's like a trust to us, a gift. So if you've been trusted with this inspiration and motivation and these design opportunities and you've got your, uh, you know, your teams that you can work with or your friends that can help you, that's a service you need to put in front of others. Where does all those things end up? You end up with baraka, which is this spiritually nourishing uh, effect you have, which I think Muhammad, you know, you are really my go-to guy when it comes to, you know, explaining and communicating Baraka. But the idea of bringing all these approaches and aspirations spiritually into design, and you end up with this Baraka, and that's also in your own life as where you apply that, you know, with the right way, you get that that Baraka effect in your life, inshallah. Absolutely, it's part of that, and that's powerful. I mean, just, and I want to guess here from you applying this principle maybe if you're a living example of that have you seen example of where you apply those principles 
and seeing that baraka, seeing that impact kind of beyond expectation? Yeah, I think all the time, you know, it's, it's a, again, it's, it's not a new phenomenon. It's a, it's a timeless thing. You know, I had a, a visitor in the studio yesterday who spent the last, you know, 15 years studying, um, you know, traditional sciences of, uh, you know, Islamic philosophy. And he's, um, you know, he spent time with master craftsmen. And right now he's, you know, doing a leather making course and working on, you know, bringing ahsan and beauty in, in stitching. And he, he quotes some old, you know, very old scholars talking about, you know, with each stitch, put that, you know, intentionality into it. You know, that's really Islamic art. If you ask me what's Islamic art, it's not just visually how something looks with calligraphy or mosaics or tiling. That's all beautiful. But they're the result of working through this process of something with ahsan, working through with intentionality and knowing that whatever you're doing is, you know, any beauty in that is a reflection of the divine source of beauty. So, uh, I mean, there's many thousands of examples uh, we see all around places you visit. You visit Dalhambra, you visit palaces in Turkey or even just some you know, little place in uh, in Fez in Morocco that's, you know, probably almost falling apart. You can feel the baraka in it because of, of the intentionality behind it. And why is it so, why are thousands and thousands of Europeans visiting every month there? Well, I think because there's some blessing, isn't it? It's not just a visual design. There's something special. Um, but in, in, I guess, last thing I'll say, in the contemporary modern context of design and what we're building, the apps we're building, the platforms, the websites, the creative communities, uh, maybe products we're building for, for children with this intentionality um, to, to give them more wholesome content and alternatives to just, you know, the, the Disney Plus kind of model that exists um, to, to build. I think that's, a, you know, that's on a lot of parents' minds this year in particular, um, you know, doing that in a way that um, with the right intentionality, the baraka might only be felt in a generation from now, <laughs> you know, it's it's redefining our sense of time so that, okay, I'm going to get started on some ideas, you know, that might inspire someone else to build a thing. And it might not be me individually that builds the startup or the company that becomes this huge platform, but maybe some of my ideas trickle down and inspire this person and that inspires that person. They have an opening and they get blessed with, you know, some investment and a team and they build this beautiful thing. But that's Baraka is, you know, it's, it flows throughout time. And Muhammad, you've you've you know enlightened me a lot on the potential of Baraka. I think you you capture it really well. And I love that, that when you mentioned the idea of, of the kind of the long term effect of this, right? It's it's almost like imagine we know a lot of time we kind of designing our lives. We think about oh you know YOLO, right? You only live once. Let me maximize my life. Yep. Let me get let me let me try to see how I can get the most out of this life. But the moment you start thinking generationally. And then you realize, mm -hmm. well, I have no idea how things will happen like three, four generations down the road. But what I have control over is my intentions. What I have control over or have some some kind of decision over is if I do something with Ihsan or not. You know, if I if I do something with service and manner, like these are things that are within kind of my sphere of control. And these are things that I can work on. And I have no idea how this will turn up. And this can be very inspiring, very motivational as well. Uh, because a lot of people, you know, sometimes these because they don't see the results in their life or they see they work so hard, they don't see the impact, they feel like, what's the point? I've tried this, it didn't work for me. So can you speak yes. to this idea of maybe, you know, I always use the idea of the garden, right? They have the garden of planting the seed and, and, mm. and seeing how things work. So whether whether it's it's a startup, whether it's a family, whether it's, a, you know, someone thinking post retirement what to do, you know, how do you how do you plan? How do you how do you plan with that without uh, knowing if you're going to see the fruits in your life or not, like that, that's a different paradigm yeah. shift as well. It is. And, and I think you've gone to the heart of our understanding, you know, and our understanding where, you know, and I'm very much a part of the, the system in that, you know, that, you know, I'd like to, this thing that I'm working, I'd love to see it succeed commercially within a short period of time. I'd like to, from ideas to get traction and be, uh, you know, to, to, to be successful. And I, you know, I'd like to, you know, th there's, you project onto it. And, and I think that's important as well. There's definitely an element of like, you know, you need to make something sustainable. You need it, you know, ideally what you're working on becomes sustainable for you professionally. You have to provide for your family and, and, you know, you want to, you know, having some wealth can also give you the right impact with the right intentionality. Um, but I also think just don't limit your understanding of success to just that. And I think that's where a lot of design organizations and startups and companies fall down today is, you know, we focus just on that and maybe a little bit on the edges we talk about, um, you know, okay, just making sure we're good to the environment, good to employees. That's sort of almost like a checklist for, 
But yeah, other companies you see, it's at the heart, it's in their DNA, it comes through their team culture, the way they approach things. And I see, I think there's a lot of promising signs there as well. Uh, but it, it is tough, you know, and I, I can't say that I've it, it definitely not mastered this idea of, of working on things and hoping they'll work out. I will say this, though, is that over the years, um, our team, our design teams always had this mindset to be experimental, to try little innovative ideas, to make sure we've got a little bit of budget each month to work on internally just ideas, um, knowing that we think these are helpful and these are good things to do and they'll help, you know, at some point. I can tell you that probably 80% of them go nowhere after a couple of years. I mean, my, I've launched a few little apps and little sites and things just as experiments. But, you know, what they do is they give you tremendous learning that you, and they also plant seeds, just like a gardener. And my favorite example is that there was an app that we built that was inspired by my two daughters. Uh, we put it on launch, could actually, uh, in 2013, called mm -hmm. Salam Sisters. And it was an app. It was a really simple app. It wasn't particularly well designed, um, but it was trying to address some of the challenges we had as, as parents trying to create you know, more wholesome uh, content. And what we found was um, the app itself wasn't amazing, but the idea was, was meaningful to people. They resonated with these diverse kind of characters, better representation in, in content and media. And that sparked a couple of other things in other related circles that I was connected to for other projects. And we ended up getting some funding and support. And we said, you know what, let's build this properly as a brand that we want to globally create. And we ended up with Salam Sisters being reimagined as this beautiful series of dolls, full-size 18-inch dolls um, that uh, have ended up in the homes of, you know, thousands and thousands of people around the world. And every day we get little messages of, you know, kids or their parents sharing photos of like what they're doing with their Salam Sisters doll. You know, it's sold out globally at the moment because of, you know, pandemic and production and a few things. But the, um, but that, that to me was an example of just starting small with the intention and just hoping, you know, it, it will go somewhere. Uh, but I didn't know when I started it that that would become such a powerful, beautiful product in the world. And the success there is not just in how many sold or how many countries, but, you know, the joy of the, of the kid that emails and say, oh, my gosh, this doll looks like me. I was like, oh, wow, like finally, you know, not everyone just looks like this one monocultural type of character I always used to see. Now I've got, you know, this, this diverse set. So I think that's an example of, of, you know, having that intentionality and then having trust, you know, to wackle that it's going to, um, you know, end up exactly where it should. <laughs> I mean, as someone who's who actually watched the launch of, um, you know, watched the launch of Slam Sisters, I honestly saw you apply these principles, the sincerity, and the intentionality behind it. I know that you, you're driven a lot by your daughters as well, trying to do something for your daughters. The craftsmanship, I mean, God, I mean, I mean you went, I want you guys went to like the nth degree, find the best talent worldwide, most, sometimes very expensive as well, to actually design the dolls. The, the gratitude and the way that, you know, the way you were just, just the, 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 the process through all the ups and downs, right? I've seen that in live. And then the service that you really want to represent is very multidimensional, you know, diverse Muslim Ummah and, and do something of service to Ummah. And then seeing the, the blessings, like it was, I think it was an ABC on CNN. It was just like, it was be, it went, it went wild, subhanAllah. And, and even, and I think that, just seeing that, and like I said, it's without people, when someone said design your life, they might've thought, I'm gonna sit down, I'm gonna sketch what my life will look like five years from now, and then kind of expect this to happen. What you're saying is, it's almost like go through this process which is you know reframing the question, prototype, test, empathize, do the you know do the do the work, but fuse it, fuse it with this this the baraka factor, fuse it with intentionality, fuse it with ihsan, and then kind of like see see the see the baraka happen, see that fruit grow, that tree. We're like, whoa, panel, I never expected that fruit to come out. I didn't say it taste this good. Oh, oh my god, this is actually tastes very sour. I need to work on you know thinking <laughs> how to work yeah. on that. And, I, and, I, and that's a, yeah. again, this is like, a, I can't stress how that's a paradigm shift. I mean, I've been in the productivity world for a while and, and a lot of times people think of goal setting and life goals and visualization, and cut those pictures on magazine, that's how you're gonna look like. Mm -hmm. And here you are talking about sun and sincerity, which some might think is quote unquote, not a waste of time, but it's like, yeah, but when, when do I get to actually, you know, plan my life? I wanna, I wanna, be, I wanna be in control, I wanna plan everything. How, how do you yes. get rid of that? need for control, need for things to work out your way, and really yeah. letting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala basically knowing that he's in control and you're just doing your part, adding your fusing with that ihsan and intentionality. 
Yeah, well, exactly right. And and then and I, and again, I can't say that I have discovered the the answer. I myself, in the process of prototyping, iterating of you know being closer and further to that that connection, that wi- Wi-Fi signal. And you know, I also think that our efforts, you know, entrepreneurially and in the the kind of the trying to design work we're each trying to do in our lives, that can also, of course, be ibada. That can be a devotional act if it's done in the right intention. Um, you know, very much. So the same way that people years ago might have been creating beautiful objects or doing wonderful manuscripts or architecture or creating a wonderful way to people to come in and experience a courtyard or, you know, make their wudu or refresh, you know, with, with water. Um, but they design that or beautiful garden, you know, beautiful Islamic, gar- you know, designed gardens. They're not beautiful just because they look a certain way. They're beautiful because when you enter these spaces and you feel that beautiful richness and illuminate your heart, you know, you feel something wonderful there. Um, and that's because, you know, as one of my teachers explained, you know, every brick, every tile, every place is done with, you know, with intentionality and beauty. And, you know, you feel something. People feel connected to it. So, you know, I think a great challenge and p- design problem for our generation of, you know, emerging Muslims with entrepreneurial aspirations, but also strong spiritual intention. Um, can we create brands and products uh, and experiences that have that level of love and SN? And it's, it is difficult because, you know, for example, when, when the iPad first came out and we got asked to work on one of the first Quran apps for iPad, um, we were like, oh, okay, like, is this a good idea? Like, should, like do, you know, like, wait, don't people want the book? But then, you know, now if you ask many, many Muslims today, they, they'll have it on their phone, whether they use it or not. But, but designing something so powerful and, and, you know, something you don't want to dilute or, you know, trivialize um, into an app form, like this, now we're so used to that idea. But 10 years ago, nine years ago, it was such a novel concept. I was even like asking my teacher, wait, do we need to have Wudu to hold the iPad? And like, how, you know, like these, but now it's, you know, so in 10 years, things quickly kind of change. Um, so if all of us on the call just embrace that designer mindset or grow into it, um, bring your curiosity, your imagination, and your spiritual intention, you have this wonderful package of potential in front of you. I love that. I love that. I think I think you've, you've captured really, really well and just really powerfully, you've you kind of framed the design problem for our generation, right? How, how might we, <laughs> yeah. right? right? It's like, how might we bring, you know, especially with entrepreneurs, how might we bring products, services, experiences, even a personal level to our families, to our ourselves, to our to our parents, to those around us that connects kind of like, you know, that, that basically infuses with spirituality. I think that's that's kind of the key element because, and again, whether you're in the startup world, whether you're a professional, whether you're leading a team, whether you're running a business, whether you're, you're, you're trying to keep a family together, it's not just the design problem we need to think about, but it's what you've termed this heart-centric design approach, the, the you know, the bringing the heart into it. And, and the heart requires, you know, that idea of sincerity and ihsan. So, Let's let's get a bit more practical. So let's say somebody, okay, I'm I've subscribed to the idea of heart-centric design. I wanna I wanna from now on any challenge I face, any problem that I struggle with, personal, professional, I wanna bring this heart-centric design thinking approach to it. Where do I start? Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, I think just by one, by, by switching on this idea of, first of all, being become more aware of design in your environment and how design works on you. And not just this idea of visual design or how a sign looks or how a product looks and feels, but, you know, the psychology of things. Why is it when, you know, a bunch of people, probably, you know, tens of thousands tuned in to see the Apple keynote yesterday, uh, you know, okay, they're announcing a new service and, you know, they're, and, you know, they're the next iteration of whatever they're doing. It's not just about the product, but why people, you know, invest, why, why do they care? You know, what is it? There's more going on here than just, oh, it's okay, it's a new object to buy. It's, you know, there's more, there's, there's an emotionality to it. There's a sense of, you know, for some people of like being early adopters, there's, there's a lot here all embedded. So I'd say just first of all, become aware of design in the broader sense and, and start looking at how design is used on you. Sometimes it's in the advertising, commercial context. Other times it's just like, hey, I need to order a thing or go to a place or check Google Maps. Okay, is it easy to use? You know, just think every every decision had to be made, you know, in order for you to have that simple user experience or maybe a bad one. You know, if you're trying to deal with a bank 
and then you can't get a hold of them and they make their contact details impossible to find, you know, or if you go through a door, but the door is, you know, the wrong way. So just becoming aware of design everywhere is a great first step. And then I'd say practically then starting to reframe and rethink. So getting to the habit of not just seeing, a, you know, I need to do this thing, but reframe the question that you bring to it. And it could be a simple thing in your life or a professional challenge. Oh, I've got to do this meeting. I don't want to do that. You know, we, you could reframe it. Um, you know, and there's even in, very, in spiritual terms, there's a lot of simple, beautiful things like, okay, let's say an app's really slow or the internet's slow, but you've got to do something. I, there's one particular I think I, I do on Instagram uh, sometimes, but it just takes it takes a while to load up, right? Which is unusual, even just because it's pulling stuff from the cloud. And bef- most of the time, it's like, oh, come on, hurry up! I, like I'm sitting here wasting my time. Now I'm like, okay, I'll do a f- just a little bit of bicker, <laughs> like just like three, four things in a row. I'm sure you have much better productivity hacks, but like now I'm like, yeah, let it load. Take your time. Let it load. Let's load now. The image. Now I can put the image in. So. You know, that's reframing an opportunity. (laughs) How might I use this time for something beneficial? And and add butter to my time and add butter to my life. That's that's very powerful. We have a question from Shamira. She's saying, most days we are on autopilot. How do we pragmatically bring the heart-centric design? Because we're just in well with, you know, and just break from the autopilot mode. Yeah, exactly. We'll, st- we'll start small. Don't, don't be hard, too hard on yourself. You know, like there's a reason why we've ended up in this kind of, you know, state that we're all in. And, and I don't want to, I'm very much about not adding and create, you know, adding complexity. You know, the best design is almost invisible because it's simple. It's simplicity. It gets out of the way. So I would try to put it in reverse. It's like, don't try to add, oh, I've got to now think about design. And I'm also trying to like feed this thing and run there and do that. So you know, it's just you know becoming a bit a bit more aware of and just embracing that designer mindset a little more. Um, but I'd just say, like you know, the next time you have some particular, um, let's say, opportunity or, or chapter or something you're thinking about, let's say, a lot of times I've noticed people that do my courses and our classes, they've been thinking about this for so long. They have something in their mind, or like, oh, I've got this idea for an app, or oh, I really want to start a business that does that, right? Well. Rather than let it get stuck in there, um, you know, a simple thing. Do just do do some writing about it. Get a little journal, paper. I, I definitely recommend not digital for that, and just write some things down. You would be surprised the potential that just starts flowing if you've been ruminating for a while. And so, let's say you're on a train or public transport, have that journal and just let it go. Like just be uninhibited, write, sketch. You know, just let it flow out. Um, that's so powerful and profound and you look at people like in history, Leonardo da Vinci filled seven, 8,000 pages of, of notebooks that you can still see today, um, flowing ideas and imagination and sketches, you know, you know, like the pen is so powerful. Just let that flow a little bit, you know, so you will have at some point time to sit down and use a pen and paper. It can be very therapeutic um, just to even start that tiny practice. That And, and I love how, again, these are very, very practical. So again, it's almost like you... you frame a question, you frame a problem, you frame a challenge, you write about it, and then and then you kind of fuse it with this constant intentionality with your hasan, with craftsman service, and you kind of bring those meanings. And almost like these are like lenses, like what would it look like if I were to approach this problem with intentionality? Coming back to our problem of the, you know, let's say morning stress, right? How might we add more intentionality to our morning routine? How might we you know, add more hasan to morning routine. How might we add more aman and you know, and or craftsmanship, and be and each of those questions will trigger a set of ideas and thoughts and maybe perhaps even action points that you can go on and experiment. And I think that, that that's that can be. I, I just think about now it can be very very powerful. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And again, none of these things are necessarily new. It's not some fad. It's not some you know like. A, crazy new tech technology or technique. Um, in fact, a lot of these like, things we're talking about are very, very ancient because they, they worked. <laughs> um, but it's, you know, in our digital age, it's how do we also draw on the best of those things and help them, you know, uh, apply to our, our daily activity. And, you know, particularly with technology where we're still in, we're very much in catch up. We know some of the dangers, we know some of the potential um, but I don't think, you know, we, we shouldn't shy away from experimenting and, and creating products and working. You know, there's, a, there's an incredible potential of the, the beauty and richness that 
from our tradition and our spiritual path that we can share with others if we get the right designed experiences. I mean, for me, it's it just seems like imagine we, you know, the things that we've learned and the things we learn in our tradition that is so helpful to bring peace and and tranquility to your heart. Like. Who wouldn't want that? Like, it's such a powerful thing today, you know, and there's paths to it through mindfulness and meditation and, and books. And, and there's apps now that help people meditate. That stuff's becoming very popular. But people that have been on a spiritual path for some time and, and have that, you know, the, the confidence and, and the, you know, the clarity of, of what we understand in our spiritual path, um, couldn't we design some things to invite more people to explore it? It's not to say, hey, this is do this, you know, that that doesn't really work, and especially in the Western context. But, um, you know, design some experiences that, you know, draw people to the water. Uh, and, and books don't necessarily work very well anymore. For some people, yes. For a lot of people, they don't read um, apps, yes. But then how do you create apps and digital things that might lead people? Um, what about what's coming ahead? Are there more virtual reality experiences that we could be thinking about? Don't shy away from the potential of what tools, even when you look at something like the Omeyyad Mosque in Damascus, beautiful, stunning, um, you know, the uh, you know, Al-Aqsa Mosque, the design of those were heavily inspired by the Byzantines of the time. You look at the floral motifs, the technologies, and I think my understanding in, you know, the tradition of, you know, Islamic art and design has always been borrowing and adapting and learning technology. Calligraphy wasn't just revealed in a day, and here is, a thousand years of history and styles that took time that evolved. The craftsmen, the designers always drew from the inspiration of the technology, the tools available in ceramics and design and artifacts. And they brought their intentionality to it and always resulted in these beautiful, beautiful things that have lasted for generations. What are we building and thinking about and making that will be beneficial to people ongoing? That's, that's our design challenge. had a project where you call Islam Imagined, which was for kids' activities where you get kids to start imagining what it would look like to have a mosque in space, right? And, and all sorts of yeah. <laughs> you know, very faith-inspired creative activities. Can you just talk about, I guess, you know, for, for the parents out there who want to bring not only design thinking, but heart-centric design thinking to their children, what activities, what, thought, what are practical ideas you could share that they could help in that process? Yeah, absolutely. So um, there's definitely a big movement in, in, in education to see that okay, there is a um, there's a there's an important part that's missing in, in a lot of curricula, which is you know really this this artistry and creativity and you know reconnecting to nature and you know having more sense of um, awe and imagination and free play and all the kind of things that um, are required to build you know beautiful and um, you know uh, I think um, innovative. Uh, ways of, of addressing the problems we have today that you know it's not just math science English and like okay now go and you know set, solve uh, you know uh, design you know things to help so, so solve water or transportation or how do we use the earth's energy in a bunch you know that requires a rounded set of skills and thinking and you know co co collaboration creativity entrepreneurial thinking how do we nurture those sets of skills in our young people around the world I think there's a lot of good efforts of, of doing that in, and in terms of, you know, particularly Muslim audiences or communities, you know, are there specific things we can also enrich that process with? And I think there are. So IslamImagine.com, as you mentioned, was a was a fun experiment and it's still kind of growing this idea of like, OK, well, how do we spark that imagination? If you ask kids to design a mosque in space, it's wonderful. Right now, we don't really need to design a mosque in space. You know, that's not really the thing. But the process of asking that question evoke some wonderful, wonderful um, answers and drawings. And one of my favorites is like, you know, space mask and it's so cool, it's all colorful and it's like aliens welcome. <laughs> you know, I love seeing that. Um, and then for the older kids as well, you see that uh, there's certain conventions creeping in which are not necessarily good ones. You know, this is very interesting to see the, the, the creative journey. So, you know, if you want to think about creativity, spend a day with a five-year-old, a six-year-old, uninhibited, the drawings, Pablo Picasso even said, you know, I spent, I think, 60 years learning how to draw like a child. You know, there's a reason that, you know, the curiosity, creativity, these things we desperately need to, to hold on to and foster and encourage in our young people. Absolutely. And um, there's a question from our friend Fatih from Singapore. He's saying that um, right now in year 2020, you've, you've called the year of transformation. 
And I know that you've did some uh, rebranding recently with Google Studio, but in general, how do you see right now we live in this world where everyone's unsure how things would be post COVID? How can we bring heart centric design to the post COVID world? Yeah, great question, Fatih. I mean, in many ways, you know, we we really embodied that by transforming ourselves. So we looked at our design team and the kind of projects we've been doing, and we looked at this year in transformation. We said, what what is going to what's valuable? What you know, what is something that we can do beneficially as a design team? And we looked at our culture, our process, the, you know, the kind of projects we try to do, and what values are important to us, and what what do we aspire to do? And we co- collected and, and defined that through this idea of heart-centered design. I think that's you know very meaningful and timely for a year like this year. What it tells us is that um, this design um, challenge we all face this year. A lot of us, you know, practically speaking, working from home, homeschooling. Uh, can't travel. A lot of things are changing. It doesn't mean things are finished. It's not like, oh, well, humanity, we're done. That was it. We had our go. No, the, I don't, not at all. Like we, you know, uh, we don't know when that time will be, but we know that we got to keep planting. We got to keep building, keep going, and design our way through this. So, if anything, the need for a designer mindset has been hugely elevated. We, we have a lot of things to solve, and the way of thinking, even in like consumption and you know, kind of, cons- you know, overconsumption culture uh, is not sustainable for the environment. We know that we need to redesign our way of thinking and our product. So that will take all of us around the planet, you know, step by step, iterating, designing, you know, collaborating. And, uh, you know, the post-COVID world um, that we're kind of already half in, um, you know, you have a role to play wherever you are, whatever you're listening, you have a role to play. You know, don't discount the talent and imagination you've been gifted then discount that inspiration, that idea you have, oh, I can't do that, I'm not a company or whatever. Everyone who ever did anything like started just like you. <laughs> you know, we, we, we don't have a magic, uh, you know, formula of like, just do this and then you'll have your idea successful. It's, it's, we all start, you know, from that place, the sketchbook, the idea, trying things out, just, you know, iterating, keep going through. And it might take you 10 years before you really have uh, you know, something that you feel is, is getting towards the level, but get started and, you know, have that intentionality and it'll go a long way, inshallah. Inshallah, absolutely. And, and again, and, and bring that, fuse those concepts of intentionality, ihsan, craftsmanship, and see where things go. I mean, I think, I think that's the, the, the thing I love about these hard design approaches is how empowering it is because someone said, well, I might not be a designer. I might not have ideas. I might not have resources. But well, do you have any intention? Like, okay, yes, I do. Do you have a, a mindset of service? Like, okay, yes, I do. Do you have a craft? Do you want to do things with the hand? So as long as you have this mindset, you kind of those are your compass, your guides that can help you through the design process. And you and you might not know where you're going to end up. And that's kind of the beauty of the, of this. Peter, thank you so much. I really, really appreciate your time, your insights. This has been wonderful. If someone wants to work with you, learn from you, how best to get in touch with you? Uh, likewise, Mohammed. It's been really a beautiful chat. Great blessing. Um, just search for you can either search for my name or you can find our new Gould Studio page. Uh, so just search, search for Gould Studio or follow us on our, our new social, and we'll be sharing some more of these concepts and and the thinking in the in the coming weeks and months ahead. Um, so yeah, please reach out. I'd love to learn from everyone and, and connect. We've got collectively we have a lot of work to do in front of us. So we're all uh, one big team. Um, and we'd love to be a part of your journey too. Awesome. Zach Blacher. And thank you everyone to tune in live. Those watching the recording, hope you enjoyed this and hope you found this useful, beneficial. And again, start thinking about design. If that's the of heart-centric design to everything you face in your life, whether it's your personal, professional, whether it's work or it's family. If you start bringing those concepts, elements with the design approach, inshallah ta'ala, you'll see the barakah. You'll see you'll start to design your life with barakah, inshallah ta'ala. With that, thank you all so much. Zakum Allah khair. Subhanakallah, muhamdik. Ashallah ilayhi l'ant. Astaghfirullah ilayk. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala barakatuh.